Welcome to Inside Racing. A young John McNair got no resistance from his late father when he signalled his intention to become a jockey. It seems his dad was somewhat of a frustrated jockey himself and his godfather was none other than legendary West Australian rider Tiger Moore. He's been living in New South Wales for more than 20 years now based on a magnificent 40-acre property on the Central Coast which has been home to countless winners, including the horse of his dreams, the remarkable sprinter, Hay List. John was kind enough to join us recently on the set of Inside Racing. Well, John, as a youngster, you didn't like the monotony of stable life. And for a while there, racing was the last thing you wanted to know about. Yeah, well probably came about because the, the the local kids after school they'd get to go and play football and and um, um, knock about with one another and, and I had to do a bit of stable work and um, I just associated horses with work. Eventually you decided to become an apprentice jockey and you had the full support of your late father who I believe would love to have been a jockey himself. Yeah, he's probably what you'd call a frustrated jockey. Um, he wanted to be a jockey himself, and his mother made him do a, an electrical apprenticeship and um, become a tradesman. And um, I guess the next, next best thing for him was for me to become a jockey, which is what happened. Your godfather was the legendary Tiger Moore, one of the greatest riders ever produced in Western Australia. You saw a lot of him as a kid. Did he influence your decision to become a jockey? Yeah, obviously, because, I mean, um, Tiger was very good at what he did and uh, had a very good lifestyle, um, and he was probably there to, to give me a few pointers as well. You know, you had a terrible experience on the very day that you were scheduled to have your first race ride. Yeah, Tiger from memory came around about 10 in the morning and, and I thought he was actually there to, to give me some advice on having my first ride in a race and as it turned out, um, Dad had passed away that morning and it um, uh, was a very traumatic experience. He was only 42 years of age. Yeah, 42, um, very, very young, um, heart. And then uh, it's quite amazing, my mother absolutely loved me being a trainer and, and followed every horse that we ever had. And only a couple of months before I ever started Haylist, uh, we lost Mum. Many years on following Dad's passing, of course. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mum was 87 when she passed away and Dad was 42, so long time between. Your very first boss was a trainer called Jock Campbell and he was an old school trainer and an old school boss. Oh, he had most of the leading apprentices in Western Australia at the time. He was a very, very hard man. Um, but, you know, a good teacher and you, you learnt the ropes, I can tell you that. Midway through your apprenticeship, John, you became disillusioned and you walked away from it. Yeah, I did. Oddly enough, John, I, I went to do an electrical apprenticeship to follow the path my father did. Um, did that for around about six months and then got uh, enticed back into it and I went to to Len Pike's stables at Rockingham and um, probably changed my life. You talk of Len Pike with admiration and affection and you tell me that some of the methods he used you're still using to this day. Oh, yeah, Len was a terrific trainer, a terrific bloke. Um, it was like a father figure to me and I'm still very close to the Pike family even to this day. For some bizarre reason, whenever a trainer had a rogue or an outlaw or a rat bag, he'd come looking for young John McNair to ride it. Now, why was that? Um, some people get their kicks doing lots of <laughs> weird things, and that was one of mine. Um, I loved the challenge of it, um, and I found that I was OK at it. Um, even to this day, touch wood, um, I've never broken a bone. Um, so... Uh, well, looking at some of these photos, I find it hard to believe you haven't broken a bone. Yeah, a bit of luck is involved in there, I guess, but I was also lucky that I fell the right way. I was, uh, if I hit the deck, I used to hit the ground rolling, and um, that's probably what saved me a lot of the time. Your riding career was all too short, only five years, 70-odd winners, 
but you did get to ride one very, very nice horse, all legal. And you tell me that he would have been competitive at the top level, even in Sydney. Oh, without doubt, John. He was a very, very good horse. He had massive, as it turns out, knee problems. And um, uh, he could only start once every three months. And invariably, he used to, they used to call him a first up specialist, but he was the first up specialist because he could only start once and then he'd have to go out again. Mm. When you found your feet as a trainer, you decided to move to the east, or at least to come and have a look at racing in Sydney. Now, you brought with you a mare called High Pack, and uh, her job uh, was to act as a barometer to tell you whether or not she was the type of horse that could do the job here. Probably, John, but I had a fair idea she was going to be uh, a good horse over here. She was the first Group 1 winner that I ever had, um, and she, along with Pak Lani, were the, they were the best two fillies in Perth. Uh, Pak Lani came over here and ran third in the Golden Slipper and, and won a lead up to the Golden Slipper. So I always had a fair idea that, that uh, she would measure up, but uh, it's, um, it's strange how things happen. I've only just lost High Pack's mother about six months ago. Mm. Well, thanks to High Pack... You were sold on Sydney. Yes, I think from the time I first came here, uh, I knew that this was the place to be if you were going to be a racehorse trainer or be involved in racing. Um, I'll, I'll never forget the headline when we won our first race here that um, I think uh, I mentioned something about coming to Mecca and uh, I'd seen Sydney as the place to be and, and nothing's changed that thought. Well, about 14 years ago, you set up a wonderful training establishment at Summersby near Gosford on 40 acres. You've poured a lot of time, a lot of love and a lot of money into the project. And I've got to say, John, it's one of the best uh, training operations that I've had the good fortune to see. Now, let's go through some of the high points. The barn is an imposing monument. Yeah, well, we actually built that ourselves, John. Um, me and um, some of the staff I had at the time. Um, and uh, the, I remember the early years that we were here, when we first came here, there was 2,500 orange trees on that property. Um, we've still got some several hundred there, even now. But um, uh, I think back now, and I, and I think, you know, if I, if I had my time over again, I don't know if I'd do it again, because by gee, it was hard at the time. The horses have the benefit of huge undercover yards and they've got a mile of walking space. Well, I try and keep them as natural as possible. I've always been a um, what you'd call a natural type of trainer. Um, we're fortunate that where we are, we get a breeze off the ocean, um, which in the summer is a cooling breeze. It brings the temperature down some, say, five degrees on what you'd experience at Gosford or Sydney. And in, in, um, in the winter, it's the opposite, actually. We get a, the same breeze that comes from there and, and it raises the temperature. The big silo is a sure sign that you're a grain feeder. Yes, no, I've always been a fairly um, heavy protein feeder. Um, the old adage that you've got, to, you've got to feed them well to get them to race well. You use a straight swimming channel rather than a circular one. You had one or two bad experiences with, with the round uh, swimming facility. Yeah, I had a few experiences in Perth where um, I nearly lost a couple. Um, stupidly, I jumped in with them, um, but we never lost one, we saved them. Um, and in the end, I started to think that the, that the round pools might have been causing back problems with horses. So um, in those days, I used to sometimes swim them in each direction but now I sort of subscribe to the fact that um, a straight pool would probably cause a lot less problems. The walking machine is completely enclosed for safety reasons. Yeah, well, it's, it's, um, it's just a, one of those facts that up where we are now, we probably get um, uh, one in every three days will be wet. So obviously you've got to cater for that. And we find that uh, in that enclosed area, um, they're not aware of too many things going on. There's less chances of injury, injuries. It's, it's certainly much better. Now, the secret weapon may well be the wonderful 1,200-metre sand track, big enough for you to really let them stride along. 
Yeah, I think the the really helpful thing with that track, John, is that it, there's a very, very strong incline and they do most of their fast work up a um, quite a steep hill and um, you can send a horse up there at even time and it's just like um, a hard gallop. I remember you telling me once that if you couldn't ride them work, you don't want to train them. Does that still apply? It does, John, and unfortunately it's, I'm probably getting towards the end of that part of my career as well. Um, uh, I don't know how many more years I've got left of riding, but um, uh, I'm, I'm tipping that, um, that I'm not far away from the finish of it. You had a few horses in the 90s whose names incorporated the word ears, E-A-R-S. Easily the most notable was Ears Ronnie. Uh, and what a tough old horse he was. Uh, I can recall Brian York winning on him at Randwick one day. They were going to run over him halfway down the straight and he fought back to beat them clearly. I think he was just one of those horses that was uh, very laid back and, um, and he wouldn't really put in till they got up alongside of him. Sovereign Kite, 110 starts, 12 wins. I remember one day he won the Canterbury Cup with Shane Dye on board and he finished very fast. In the middle stages of that race, he was 41 lengths behind the leader. Um, he finished up winning that race by a length and a half, I think, and, and broke the race record. John Ears Ronnie, as I said, 137 starts. Sovereign Kite, 110. Thoroughbreds rarely race that often. Standard breads do all the time. Uh, you've proven that this fragile animal, and Tommy Smith woke up to this too, can cop a lot more than people think they can. Yes, listen, the horses that you can, you can do that with, they're, they're all good movers. And I had the benefit in those days of being able to ride them myself, so I could make sure that I kept that movement pristine. Um, I think Mustard would probably have outdone all of those horses because he, had he not had a few years off along with me, um, God only knows how many runs he would have had because I think he must have had um, around 120 when I retired him, I'm not really sure. But um, uh, he's still as sound as the day. He's, in fact, he's sounder now than what he was when he was a young horse. Well, you preempted my next question. So I'm pleased you mentioned that magic name, Mustard, another one of the uh, McNair horses with an unusual name. He had 131 starts, to be exact, 17 wins and 30 placings. Uh, he breaks all the rules, Mustard. He won. He never won first up until he was 10, then he did it at 10. <laughs> and th then he came out and won yeah. first up at 13 over 1,100 metres. Well, he raced every season from 2 to 14, 12 seasons, at least had one or two starts in, in some of those seasons. He had a tendon injury years and years and years ago and he had surgery for a breathing problem years and years ago. And the word freak is used carelessly, but I think he was one of those, wasn't he? Well, I've often said, John, um, in my lifetime I may see another hay list. I'll never see another mustard. Well now, what, what about this one? Hay List. He won eight from nine in Western Australia before coming east. You'd been watching him on Sky Racing with great interest and you almost dropped the phone when Katie Davenport contacted you one night. Yeah, no, it, it did happen that way too. I, I, um, she, Katie rang me and said, oh, if you got, just ring to see if you've got room for, a, for another horse. And I was a bit dumbstruck and I knew they didn't have too many other horses. And I said, oh, it wouldn't be a very, really big horse, would it? And she said, yes. Well, my knees then went to jelly. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's, um, it's, it's been a wonderful ride with him. First up for you, he ran second in the June Stakes at Randwick. Then you slipped him to Brisbane for the Healy Stakes, which he won with Chris Munson on board. 
when he won that race for Chris in, in Brisbane, um, even I at that stage didn't know just how good he was. And uh, we walk, walked away from the course thinking, gee, you know, what have we got here? Well, John, you, you spelled him after that. And he came back to win three group races on the trot, the McEwen, uh, the Manicato Group 1, and the Gill guy at Flemington. Yeah, the, he's, he's done everything that I've ever asked him, very workmanlike. Um, the unfortunate thing was after the Gill guy, he, he injured himself on a horse trough. And um, our first meeting with, with the great mayor, Black Caviar, probably shouldn't have happened on that the day that it happened. Mm. We can't change that now, but a uh, testament to the horse's courage. He had a major gash in his shin, which had been uh, stitched up. He had quite a few stitches in it, mm. and he was still alongside of her at the furlong. Yeah. He finished out of a place. The, the race was the Patanak Farm Classic in November of 2010. Now, they didn't clash again until the following autumn in the Lightning Stakes, and she beat him three and a quarter lengths. Now, you knew how good he was. You must have been sitting in the stand gobsmacked to see this little black mare beating him that easily. Yeah, that, that win of Black Caviar's that day is probably unprecedented. It, it, she, I've never seen a horse ease down so far out in a 1,000 metre race, let alone a 1,000 metre Group 1 race. Uh, I think Nolan put the handbrake on about uh, about 80 or 90 metres out in that race. Uh, we we did have a slip out the barrier, which caused him problems later on, and that's actually part of what happened in Brisbane. Um, so we'd been unlucky that we just had a couple of niggling things go wrong, and um, so we kept having excuses to that point. Their next clash was in the TJ Smith. This time she beat him two and three quarters. She must have been getting up your nose by this. Oddly enough, John, I went to the races that day thinking I'm going to beat her today. And I had all these little plans in my head, um, uh, which didn't actually happen. I, I had it in my, my head that that uh, we would go to the front, um, Crystal Lily would be inside of Black Caviar and Crystal Lily would run him off the track because that's what happened in the Golden Slipper, none of which happened. Uh, we were going to kick clear and, and uh, she, wasn't going to, she was going to wobble around the corner and it was her first start in this direction. But she whacked us that day and, and that's when I really started to think then, well, gee, this thing's a freak. It's got to be a freak. Then came the BTC Cup and he got a little closer this time, two lengths. Again, John, I got to the races and I saw Black Caviar and, and to my eye I thought, oh, you know, she's trained off a bit, this mare. We'll get her today. <laughs> <laughs> You'll never learn, will you? So, no, I, I don't. <laughs> well, as if he didn't have enough troubles chasing her, down he comes with a leg infection and a bad one. Yes, it, it was not only clear career-threatening, um, it was life-threatening. Um, there was two vets throughout that saga that, that said that he may not race again. Um, and he confounded everybody by coming back and I think better than ever. Um, only to run into Black Caviar again in the Lightning. Yep, nine months later. Yeah, well, I mean, I still maintain that um, had we been able to get a little bit more work into him, um, it, things have, may have been different. But, um, you know, let's face it, she was coming back from 1,400 metres to 1,000 metres. Again, I thought, well, you know, she can't do that. No, no horse can do that. Not, no other horse could. Not in a week, anyhow. Yeah. Um, and she whacked us again. Yeah. Well, the new market was three weeks away. So you brought him home, you knew he'd be more content at Summersby, and you decided to top him up in a barrier trial at Wyong, and Glyn Schofield came to Wyong trials to ride him, and back you go to Melbourne for the Group 1 new market handicap, and there's no sign of black caviar. What a relief. Oh, I don't think it would mattered who was there that day. Um, he was awesome. Well, the, the, the weight that, that Black Caviar would have had to give him, she wouldn't have beaten him. Um, and as it's turned out, um, he finished up with a massive chunk of grass stuck under his um, near front hoof. And um, that finished up 
that split his hoof open in that race. So his win that day was nothing short of amazing and very few people would know that that's actually what happened. Um, Glenn actually got off and said that he thought the weight had got to him that last little bit. Well, it wasn't the weight, it was, it was pain. Well, Johnny decided to press on with plans to run him in the William Reed Stakes, but he wasn't right that day. Well, I, I was dealing with that split heel um, and it was quite significant. Um, he hadn't had a saddle on his back for nine days leading into that race. Um, and the, the turned out to be a blood blister type abscess that burst out the morning of the race. And if it hadn't have been for that, he wouldn't have even been able to start into that, in that race. So, you know, his run in that race was actually quite freakish. Well, it's not hard to imagine your first words when he came down with a crippling colic attack. Now, John, when you read or hear the word colic when a horse is in trouble, most people assume you're talking about a twisted bowel. In this case? No, no. Um, the vets that did the operation put it this way. They said it was bad plumbing. Um, his, his intestine had got looped around behind his cecum and it kinked. And then it was a gaseous colic. It wasn't an impaction or anything like that. Um, that kink, when the gas got more intense, tightened up further and further to the point where the poor bugger just blew up like a balloon. And the trip to, to Sydney in the float was quite traumatic. Um, and then we got him there, it was a relief to get him there. And, and um, when they opened him up, it was, it was, if it hadn't been for the fact that they pulled his intestines out to check and make sure there was nothing further the problem, um, the operation would have been over and done with in, in 10 or 15 minutes. Much worse was to come. He slipped and fell in a veterinary clinic and caused serious damage to a knee. And you've only just got that sorted out. What happened? Um, well, they tell me that um, one in a thousand can, can um, have that type of injury from waking up from anaesthesia. He's one of those thousand, one in a thousand. Um, we're unlucky that that happened. We're lucky he's alive. We're lucky that he's now had an operation which may uh, allow him to go back to the track and come back successfully. Um, the operation was um, quite a success and um, it's given us a, um, a real hope that, um, that he will make it back to the races. You're hopeful. Yeah, very hopeful. John, your wife Sue is a great horse lover, as you are, and she's a very important member of the team. She is, John. Um, when Sue lost her pony um, in January of this year, it um, left a very, very big hole for her. So what I did was I gave her Hayless to, to look after, which she, like everything Sue does, she, she takes on um, like no other. And, um, you know, she's probably a, a huge part in the success or the improvement of the horse from this, this preparation as, as I am. And, um, and she's probably going to be a big part of why the horse will make it back to the racetrack. It's been a long journey, but a very happy and successful one. An amazing journey, John. You know, um, a lot of the things that have happened in my life and my racing career, if you read about it in a book, you'd think it wasn't possible. Um, I mean, it's amazing that, you know, we talk of Haylist, if you like. Um, only some months before I'd said to Sue, um, I've just come back from, from time out and for the first time in my career, I'm struggling. I haven't got a decent horse and I was feeling a bit miserable. And then out of the blue came a phone call and life changed. And that's what this industry is like, you know. Um, one week you can have nothing and the next week you can be on top of the world. And um, there are hundreds and thousands of other people in the same situation and you've got to have those lows to experience, to, to appreciate the highs.